So lecture 20 is on the mean value theorem, which is again a major result that we typically cover in the uh, first semester of calculus. So um, let's get to it. Um, first of all, we need to define, um, you know, relative maximum, relative minimum. And so it is exactly what it sounds like, right? Um, the function has a um, local minimum at a if f of x is greater than or equal to f of a for all x in the domain and sufficiently close to uh, the point. I mean, you can pick some delta such that this inequality holds, right? That makes it a local minimum. And um, likewise, it's a local maximum if the value of f of a is larger than the values of the function for all x sufficiently close to a in the domain. Notice that um, this allows you to have local maximum. If, if the domain had like a endpoint, this would allow local maxes and local mins to be on endpoints, right? Um, so it's like it's conceivable that the place we're talking about the local max or local min is 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 on a boundary point of the domain. Um, you know, different different calculus one textbooks dodge this issue in various ways. Um, <laughs> Anyway, Fermat's rule says the following. It says that um, if i is an in open interval and f is a function from i to the reals, if f has a local minimum or maximum at a and f is differentiable at a, then f prime of a is equal to zero. So, right, so if you think about it, a local max or min's got to be a place with like a horizontal tangent. Um, that makes a lot of sense, but we can, we'll, we'll look at the proof here shortly, but um, in addition, like a lot of times we, I would extend Fermat's rule to say, okay, so f has a local maximum or, or minimum at a and i, um, then either f is differentiable with derivative zero or the derivative doesn't exist, right? told them not to call back so many times. I don't, I don't know. Anyway. Alright. Life goes on. Life goes on. Um, so, here's a picture of Fermat's rule, right? I mean, is a picture a proof? Well, <laughs> almost. I mean, you see that, of course, the derivative has to be zero at, at, at maxims and mins. Or, and, um, you know, talking about the absolute value function, right? Where's, where's the minimum? Well, the minimum's right here, right? And what can you say about that? If this is f of x, well, f prime of zero does not exist, right? We, we saw that in the last lecture. So, um, you know, this is the extension of Fermat's rule. Either the derivative exists and it's zero, or it's a place, a local max or a local min has to happen at a place where the derivative doesn't exist. All right. Now here's the proof of the part about the derivative anyway. The a part about the derivative not existing is just like, you know, um, logical comment. Let's see here, where my proof, 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 proof. Let me zoom in a bit. All right, so if f has a local minimum then that means that there exists a delta greater than zero sufficiently small such that f of x is larger than f of a for all x in that ball, right? And so we can look at the b plus, right? What was b plus? That was, if I recall correctly, a comma a plus delta, I believe was b plus. b plus of a semicolon delta, as opposed to um, a minus delta comma a, which was b minus of a semicolon delta. If you take the union of the b plus and the b minus, you get b sub naught of a delta, which is the deleted open ball, where a has been a has been deleted. Anyway, so f of x minus f of a over x minus a is greater than or equal to zero for all x and b plus, right? And um, I'm not sure why he's why is he focused just on plus. Hmm. 
Oh, let's continue on here. I'm I'm not, not I'm wondering why the plus at the moment. But anyway, let me let me go on here. All right, so because we're assuming f is differentiable, it follows that the limit of that as x goes to a is f prime of a. Um, which, of course, the left and the right limits must agree. So the right limit of f of x minus f of a of uh, x minus a has to be, well, we know that that's greater than zero, so this is greater than zero. Um, okay. Similarly, f of x minus f of a over x minus a is less than or equal to zero for all x and b minus. Oh, I'm an idiot. So the reason... Okay, I got, I got it, I got it. So for B plus, what can you say about X minus A? So for B plus, we have A less than X, right? Less than A plus delta. But in other words, more to the point, X minus A is what? It's, 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 it's what? It's, um... It's greater than zero, right? In, a, in contrast here, if a minus delta is less than x is less than a, then that says that x minus a is less than zero. So if f of x is greater than or equal to f of a, then the, the numerator is positive, and the denominator is positive in this case, so it's greater than or equal to zero. In contrast, in the b minus case, we have the numerator still um, not negative, right? It's greater than or equal to zero, but the denominator is negative, so the quotient is negative, or it's, it's non non positive, um, because the the denominator is negative in this case. And again, so we get f prime of a is less than or equal to zero by the same similar argument. So we have f prime of a is both less than or greater than zero, and so consequently f prime of a is equal to zero, which completes the proof. Um, in the case of a relative minimum. And for relative maximum, it's just almost the same argument. Just, um, I, I suppose that the, uh, it, you get less than or equal to zero, and then you get greater than or equal to zero. That's the difference for the other argument. But anyway, there you go, Fermat's theorem. Now, Rolle's theorem is interesting. Rolle's theorem says that if you have a function on a closed interval from A to B to the reals, and it's continuous, and it's it's differentiable on the open interval A to B. All right, we only need that. We only need dif differentiability on the open interval. And in addition, we have f of A is equal to f of B. Then what this says is that there exists a constant in the open interval such that f prime of C equals to zero. So here's a here's a picture of what's going on. So f of A suppose this is a, this is b, right? f of a and f of b are the same, right? Then, I don't know what the graph of the function is. It could be whatever, but it has to start and stop at the same y level, you know? That's the assumption of the theorem. And it's, it's continuous, right? So it can't jump. And it's differentiable, so we can draw tangent lines at each point. And so... Just intuitively, you see this theorem makes a lot of sense, right? There have to be points with horizontal tangent lines between A and B, given the data. But we can use Fermat's theorem to prove that carefully. Let's do it. So F is continuous on the compact set AB. By the extreme value theorem, there exist x1 bar and x2 bar such that F of x1 is the minimum um, and f of x2 bar is the maximum of the values of f over ab. <clears throat> In other words, it's the max of f of a comma b, right? It's the image of ab under f. All right, anyway. See, we introduced this function um, 
function of set notation, but then we're afraid to use it. We should use it. Anyway. If we used it more, the students would know it more. Just saying. I get off my soapbox here for a second. f of x bar 1 less than or equal to f of x less than or equal to f of x bar 2. Um, well, that's true, because that's the minimum and that's the maximum uh, value, which is attained over the uh, closed interval by the extreme value theorem. So, okay. No, uh, no, no problem so far. I'm not sure where we're going with this, but uh, let's see where we go. Where are we going next? So, um, see if I can. Ah. Sorry. I guess I can. Well, here's the picture. I don't. I'm gonna forget cover up the picture here. All right. So if. Eh. Second, I gotta do a little. Little paper folding. There we go. All right. Trying to get some continuity in my arguments. There we go. So, um, if x bar is an element of a comma b, or if x bar two is an element of a b, then f has a local maximum, local minimum at x bar one, or has f has a local maximum at x bar two. And so then by uh, Fermat's theorem, it follows that f prime of x bar 1 or f prime of x bar 2 is equal to 0. And we can identify that the constant in Rolle's theorem would just be x bar 1 or x bar 2, right? Now, on the other hand, if... So it's either x bar... Either the min and the max are inside the open interval, or they're at the endpoints. That's, that's you know, just the uh, dichotomy of what, what's possible here, right? I mean... Anyway, so x bar 2 and x bar 1 are endpoints of AB, then, well, if they're both endpoints, if either one is not an endpoint, then we've got the theorem, because one of the other room has to be in the middle, and if they're in the middle, then it's a local max or a local min. Um, but if they're both endpoints, then we have the f bar x1 equals to f bar x2, right, because f of A is equal to f of B. Um, and in fact, by 4, 4, right, so you have f of a is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to f of b, but a and f of a and f of b are equal, that means f of x is equal to f of a is equal to f of b for all x and a, b. In other words, it's a constant function. So if it's a constant function, then f prime of c is equal to 0 for, <laughs> for any c in a, the open interval. So any way you slice it, we've got a point between a and b. Um, for which the derivative is zero by Rolle's theorem. And once you know Rolle's theorem, it's a simple matter to prove the mean value theorem. And in fact, it's actually a simple matter, well, it's a slightly less simple matter to prove um, that you can approximate a function by a Taylor polynomial. Um, like this mean value theorem argument I'm about to show you can be extended to beyond linear approximations. I guess we'll probably do that in a future lecture. But for now, the mean value theorem. And so essentially, what, what's going on here, the argument, is to say, okay, so if we look at um, a function which is, you know, um, continuous on the cl closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, then the claim is that there exists a c such that the instantaneous rate of change, f prime of c, is equal to the average rate of change, which is f of b minus f of a over b minus a for the whole interval. And um, the proof, if you really want to distill it down to a sentence, is to apply Rolle's theorem to the secant function um, from a to b. I think that's what it is. So g of x is equal to um, f of b minus f of a over b minus a times x minus a plus f of a. This is a, a line with um, slope f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Um, and a point on the line is a comma f of a. In other words, if you want to think about this geometrically, what it's doing, what this formula is doing, it's very simple. It's drawing the line. This is f of a. This is f of b. 
So, you know, if you just draw this line, that would be y equals g of x. Because what it's doing is it's taking slope f of b minus f of a rise over run b minus a, and it's multiplying by x minus a, and adding f of a, that basically bases the line point slope formula. The point is a comma f of a, which is this point right here. So anyway, that's the secant line between these two points. b comma f of b and a comma f of a. All right. All right, so let's, let's go on. So then what? Define h of x equal to the difference of f of x and the secant line. Now that's equal to this. And notice that h of a is, well, if we plug in a, we get this is 0. We get f of a minus f of a, which is 0. And if, um, f of a minus f of a, right, a, where, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll get over. So f of a, um, h of a is equal to 0. h of b is f of b. Um, when we plug in b, b minus a cancels b minus a, and we're left with f of b minus f of b minus a minus f of a. So, um, well, in short, we get f of b minus f of b plus f of a minus f of a, the way the minus is. So in short, h of b and h of a are both zero. So consequently, we can apply Rolle's theorem. And by the way, this formula for h is continuous and um, differentiable because if you look at the formula, we can differentiate. This is a number times times x minus a, which is differentiable, and and that's a constant. So this is is it's clear that g of x is differentiable, and f of x was assumed to be differentiable in the open interval. Um, so I mean, of course, g is differentiable. It's a line. Can the line be linearly approximated? I, I hope so. Anyway, um, there exists C in the open interval such that H prime of C equals zero because we can apply Rolle's theorem to H, right? And so H prime of C equals zero. Notice that H prime of X is F prime of X minus this constant. And it follows that F prime of C would be equal to this, equal to zero, but that's exactly what's needed for the mean value theorem. Hooray! Now this next example is a neat application of the mean value theorem. Um, in particular, we're going to argue that sine of x is less than the absolute value of x. So the argument goes like this, let f of x equal sine of x. Notice f prime is cosine. Um, we never proved that, we're assuming that. <laughs> um, fix, maybe it's in a section I skipped, I don't know. All right, fix x in the, in the reals and x positive. By the mean value theorem applied to f on the interval 0 to x, we have that sine of x minus sine of 0 over x is, is, is equal to cosine of c for some c in 0 to x, right? Which shows you that sine of x over x um, well, we can take the absolute value of this, right? The absolute value of sine x over the absolute value of x is equal to the absolute value of cosine c, but co the absolute value of cosine c is less than or equal to 1. Hence, sine absolute value of sine x over um, is, is less than or equal to the absolute value of x for all x positive. And um, And I, I think you could get this inequality for negative x just by properties of sine and x, but whatever. Mean value, another prop, another uh, application of mean value theorem shows there exists c in x to 0, such that 0 minus sine x over minus x is equal to cosine c. So again, the absolute value of sine x over x is less than equal to 1. So there you go. The absolute value of sine x is less than or equal to x for um, x less than 0. So for all x, we have sine x is less than equal to the absolute value of x, because of course sine of 0 is equal to the absolute value of 0. 
Um, the next example is using the mean value theorem to establish this kind of um, perhaps non-obvious inequality that the square root of 1 plus 4x is less than 5 plus 2x over 3. Um, so how's it go? Let f of x equal to that for all x greater than or equal to 2. Take the derivative. Um, fix any x larger than 2 and apply the mean value theorem on the interval 2 to x. Um, okay. Since f of 2 is 3, all right, there exists c in 2 to x such that, um, you know, this f of um, f of x minus f of 2 is equal to f prime. So oftentimes, see, this is, the mean value theorem is often stated one way and used another. So the way he's using the mean value theorem here is to say the mean value theorem says that f of b minus f of a is equal to um, f prime of c times b minus a for some c, right? Now that is equivalent to the algebraic condition which is given in the theorem, but I would just point out that that's not what we, not what we said. So apply the mean value theorem and make an algebra step. We get that, all right? And here b is equal to x and... Um, um, 2 is equal to a, or a is equal to 2, if you like. Anyway, um, f of x minus f of 2 is equal to f prime of c times x minus 2 for some c. But the thing is, f prime of 2 is 2 thirds, okay. And see here, f prime of c is less than f prime of 2. I guess it's clear that as x gets larger, the derivative does what? It's 1 over the square root of something bigger. So the derivative is decreasing. It's getting smaller as x gets larger. So if c is larger than 2, it stands to reason that the derivative at 2 should be um, larger than the derivative at c, right? Which tells us that um, the square root of 4x minus 3 is, sorry if I'm out of frame, the derivative of this here uh, is equal to f prime of c, right? But that's less than f prime of 2, which is 2 thirds x minus 2. And, uh, and then he says do algebra and we get back to what the claim was up here. So, oh, it's an interesting argument. It's uh, definitely um, something we could play with to find a lot of interesting estimates, right? So, next up, um, we find Cauchy's theorem, which they say is a, a more general result. Um, Cauchy's theorem is stated here. It's somewhat like the mean value theorem, but not quite the same, in the sense that it involves two functions, both continuous, on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, and it says that there exists a constant c such that difference in f times g prime of c is equal to the difference in g times f prime of c. Um, as I recall, Cauchy's theorem can be useful proof for like proving L'Hopital's rule, um, but anyway, here's the proof. Let h of x equal to f of b minus f of a, g of x minus g of b, g of a, f of x, right? Notice that um, if we calculate f of a, I mean h of a, we get what? Plug in a here, plug in a there. I think you just get um, well, you get f of b, g of a, and over here you get um, g of a, f of b, so those cancel. And you also get like f of a, g of a, minus, and then minus minus is plus g of a, f of a. So like h of a is um, equal to zero, and h of b is also equal to zero, so yes, they're equal. And since they're equal, we can apply Rolle's theorem to h, which means that there exists a c such that a prime, h prime of c is zero, and um, 
but of course h prime of x is also equal to this because that's a constant constant times derivative of g minus constant times derivative of f if h prime of c is zero well then plug c into here and then that's exactly has to be this term cancels that term when x is set equal to c which is precisely 4.6 so okay great So I'm guessing they're going to come back to that in a later section. Anyway, um, also sometimes useful, and I already mentioned this a little bit, you can define um, right and left derivatives. So like the right derivative is in terms of the right difference quotient. The left derivative is defined in terms of the left difference quotient. Um, and here we're assuming that the function, just to keep things simple, He's assumed that the domain of the function is a closed interval. But these notions could be extended to like, maybe the function is like, has a domain which is a closed interval unioned with like, an open interval and they're disjoint, you know? You, you could see how this definition should be applied to functions which have um, domains with like disconnected pieces. Um, but anyway, so the right derivative exists if that right limit exists and you're going to use f plus f sub plus prime of a or f sub minus prime of b for the left derivative. And of course, um, if both the left and the right derivatives both exist, that means that the double-sided difference quotient exists, and, and so the derivative um, exists. That's kind of cute, right? Um, he says, we'll say that um, f is differentiable on the closed interval a to b. If f prime exists, f prime of x exists for each x in the open interval to a b, right? And in addition, both f, the right and the left derivatives exist at the appropriate endpoints. So, yeah. So up till now, we can only talk about the derivative at a limit point. Which, if the um, domain had a had like a boundary point, we would be, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have been able to discuss differentiation up before now there those, those such points. But now that we have left and right derivatives, we can. And um, this is kind of a neat theorem. I don't think I've seen this in calculus books much. Maybe I'm, I don't remember it in any of the calculus books I usually look at. But it's kind of a neat theorem. So if a and b are real numbers and a is less than b, suppose f is differentiable on the closed interval, and lambda is a value that's between the right and the left derivatives a and b, then there exists some c in the open interval a to b such that f prime of c is lambda. And um, the, the the similar would be true if lambda would, if the uh, um, the order of the um, left and right derivatives was switched, like if you had f prime of b is less than lambda is less than f plus prime of a. You could still say this, like just like it's if it's in between the left and the right derivatives, there exists a lambda. There exists a c in the middle that matches the lambda for the derivative, right? And the proof. Now here's a here's a picture of it. That's pretty cool. So the hmm f is differentiable on. A to B. Okay. So I guess the B is like over here somewhere in this picture. You know. B. <laughs> Just add a B. There we go. Um, <laughs> so the function's differentiable on A to B. And the left and the right derivatives exist, right? Then... It's actually very interesting what this is saying. It's very cool. So like, if this has a slope that's like minus one, let's say, for the sake of discussion. And so, you know, if the, um, the other tangent line at the end, so to speak, like this one, right? Maybe that's got slope what? I don't know. Let's suppose it's three for the sake of discussion, right? Then, Essentially, minus 1 less than lambda less than 3. Um, these are the allowed 
derivatives um, between there and and there. If if we um, I'm trying, I'm over I'm maybe overstating it. I mean f is differentiable on a b. I guess. I may need like continuous differentiability to say what I'm saying. I don't know. It, do it doesn't say that, so there's probably a reason not to say it. But intuitively, it seems like these might be bounds on what the derivative can take. Um, well, I, I... Hmm. That can't quite be right, what I'm saying, because you could have like a, 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 a steep hill or valley in between, which would... Okay, fine. You can't say what I was thinking. I was hoping maybe that would put a bound on the derivative, but no, 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 no. I can't say that. I can't say that. That's just not... All we can say is that there exists a C. Um, you know, there exists a C between A and B such that F prime of C is equal to lambda. I can't... I cannot... The reverse of the theorem, I don't think that's actually true because um, at the risk of ruining this picture... You know, you could have something like, um, like that, right? And if the spike is super high, then you've got like really, really, really large values of the derivative and then really, really negative values of the derivative. And you can just make it like, it can be a smooth spike. It can just be like, you know, super tight. And uh, that's going to ruin the converse of this thing think about it. Anyway, here's the proof. If we have a function, um, g, from a to b, closed interval a to b to the reals by g of x is f of x minus lambda x, g is differentiable on the closed interval a to b, and g plus prime of a is less than zero, is less than g prime of b. How do we know that? Well, We've assumed that <clears throat> f plus prime of a is less than lambda is less than f minus prime of b. I mean, that's an assumption of this theorem. So, um, what is, well, g prime of x is what? f prime of x minus lambda, right? So, uh, <laughs> assuming, assuming that the sum, like the difference rule for derivatives extends to left and right derivatives, I mean, there's a discussion to have here, right? How do you know that, like, the differentiation laws still apply for right and left limits? Eh, well, I think they do. Um, so, anyway, um, since we, uh, we know this, it follows that G, prime, G plus prime of A is less than zero, is less than G prime might. G sub minus prime of B. Huh. I have so much trouble seeing these things. Um, because I can just subtract lambda from this inequality, and that gives me um, you know, G plus prime of um, A. I guess there's you got to think about different cases, I, I suppose. Um, Well, I don't. I guess it's not the cases I need to consider, but it's the endpoint, the left and the right derivatives. That... Anyway, we have this, and so the limit as x approaches a plus from the right, g of x minus g of a, or x minus a is less than zero. Uh, let's see here. How do we know that? Oh, goodness gracious. Well, g of a is g plus of a is less than zero, right? So that oh, this is the this is the this is g plus prime of a, right? And um, so that means that there exists a delta of one greater than zero, such that g of x is less than g of a for all x in a to a plus delta one intersect with that, all right, and similarly we can find g of x less than g of b for all x and that, b minus delta 2, right, and since g is continuous on the closed interval to a to b, it attains a minimum point at c, 
could be, and from, sorry, minimum point. And from the observations above, it follows that C is an element of AB. All right, this, this says that the minimum or the maximum can't be, well, he's claiming that that data shows that the minimum and the maximum can't be endpoints. Right. Well, the fact that g of a is lar is larger than g of x means that um, g of a can't be a minimum, and um, likewise, g of b can't be a minimum because well, g of x is smaller than it, right? So that means that g a that g is attaining a minimum not on the endpoints. So it has to obtain a minimum at something in AB, which means that um, because we've shown that the derivative exists, I mean, well, anyway, the derivative exists in the um, open interval AB by that formula. And so G prime of C is equal to zero, which is, well, G prime of C equal to zero means F prime of C minus lambda equal to zero, which means F prime of C is equal to lambda. And Oh, very sneaky, so cool. And that brings us to the exercises, so that's it for this time. And I think next up is um, applications of the mean value theorem. So I look forward to it. Thanks, guys.